Tonight, all the day's major developing stories here on Prime. A president on the picket lines for the first time. An American president joined striking workers as President Biden rallies with UAW members in Michigan. But where does he stand on the auto workers' demands? We'll have the very latest. Plus, to actually be a good fisherman, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If you need financial security, fishing is not for you. The New Jersey fishermen hoping to reel in government power in a big way, taking their case all the way to the Supreme Court in a challenge to how the government writes regulations. The impact of this case could stretch far beyond the ocean. And I mean, having panic when you're live on television as a broadcast reporter is like a free solo climber being afraid of heights. It is a major professional liability. So I. I kept it secret. Our Matt Gutman reveals his history with panic attacks and offers readers a guide to make a truce with their warring minds in his new book, No Time to Panic. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including the surprise court ruling with a judge dropping all charges against a police officer in the deadly shooting of a driver in Philadelphia. Plus, the Federal Trade Commission and 17 states are now suing Amazon, claiming it's a monopoly. We'll break down what it could mean for consumers and how the company is responding tonight. And former Vice President Mike Pence joins us live to discuss his 2024 campaign as the Republican field prepares to meet for the second debate tomorrow night. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering it all for us tonight, but we begin with breaking news. The judge that has ruled that former President Trump committed systemic fraud, lying for years about his net worth by inflating the value of his real estate portfolio. The judge said Trump's business conduct belongs in a, quote, fantasy world. The former president was accused, along with his two eldest sons and their family real estate business, of inflating properties, including his Fifth Avenue apartment by as much as $200 million, and Mar-a-Lago in Florida by as much as $600 million. In bringing the suit, New York Attorney General Letitia James accused Trump and his business of overstating their net worth by as much as $2.2 billion. The former president has continued to deny any wrongdoing, but the evidence in the judge's eyes were so overwhelming, there doesn't even need to be a trial. So what happens next? Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, leads us off. Tonight, a judge in New York has determined former President Trump committed systemic fraud, lying for years about his net worth by inflating the value of his real estate portfolio. The fraud was so overwhelming, the judge decided there was no need for him to even hear evidence or testimony at a civil trial set to begin next month. The judge found Trump inflated the value of his Fifth Avenue apartment in Trump Tower by as much as $200 million by claiming it was triple its actual size. Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million when the judge said the Palm Beach estate's assessed value was no more than $27 million. The judge agreeing with New York Attorney General Letitia James, Trump overstated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion duping banks, insurance companies, and other business partners into giving Trump, his eldest sons, and their family real estate business better terms than deserved. Trump has consistently denied wrongdoing and has attacked the attorney general and her case. But tonight, the judge rejected each of Trump's defenses, calling them bogus and deceptive, and saying at one point Trump's denials were straight out of, quote, fantasy world. Some damning words there from the bench. Let's get right to Aaron Katursky. Aaron, why is there still the need for a trial? What's left to decide at this point? Really, Lindsay, at this point, the only thing left for a civil trial that's scheduled to begin next week is how much the former president's going to have to pay in penalties. The state attorney general has asked for at least $250 million. Already, though, the ruling is severely limiting Trump's ability to do business in New York, the city that made him famous possibly even forcing him to sell some of the buildings that bear his name. But, Lindsay, his attorneys tonight tell us they plan an immediate appeal. Lindsay. Aaron Katursky for us. Our thanks to you, Aaron. We turn now to President Biden, who made history today as the first sitting president to walk the picket line in a labor dispute, joining striking auto workers in Michigan. The president grabbed a bullhorn to back the UAW, telling them to, quote, stick with it for a significant raise and other benefits. ABC's Terry Moran was there in Wayne, Michigan, and has the latest. 
President Biden made history today as the first president ever to walk the picket line. In a show of solidarity with auto workers. You heard me say it many times. Wall Street didn't build the country. The middle class built the country. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. built the middle class. Yeah. That's a fact. So let's keep going. You deserve what you've earned, and you've earned a hell of a lot more than you're getting paid now. Thank you very much. The United Auto Workers are fighting for expanded benefits, shorter hours, and a 40% pay raise over the next four years, which they say matches pay raises for the car company's CEOs. And today, the president, breaking with the practice of his predecessors, openly sided with the workers. Stick with it, because you deserve the significant raise you need and other benefits. Let's get it! Let's get yeah. back who we lost, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Afterwards, we talked with Carolyn Nippa, who works in inventory at the GM parts distribution facility where Biden joined the picket line. And what does it mean that the president came here to stand with you on the picket line? I mean, it, it means a lot. I mean, it got, I think it's going to bring a lot of attention to our cause. Um, it's going to get the attention of the CEOs that he's here, he's with us, he's standing with us. The UAW hasn't endorsed a candidate for president yet, but today the head of the union was enthusiastically grateful. Thank you to the president. Thank you, Mr. President, for coming. Thank you for coming to stand up with us in our generation's defining moment. An unprecedented move by President Biden today. Terry Moran joins us now from Michigan. Terry, former President Trump heads there tomorrow night. What's his message to these workers and what's the latest on where negotiations stand? Lindsey, Trump's message, surprisingly, is a general election message. It's going to be anti-Biden. At the same time that the Republican candidates who are opposing him are debating in California, Trump is going straight after Biden. He's going to go after him in part on the Biden administration's mandate for more electric vehicles. A lot of auto workers are very concerned about that. Uh, and Trump is going to tar him for that and, and also try to push his own candidacy as the tribune of the working class, if you will. But And he'll tell them how much better things used to be under him than under Biden with tracks with current polls. As for the negotiations, they continue. Progress is being made, but they're a long way from the deal. Lindsay? All right, Terry Moran for us. Our thanks to you, Terry. A dramatic scene played out in Philadelphia court after a judge dismissed all charges against a police officer who fatally shot a driver during a traffic stop. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is there for us. Tonight, a stunning turn in the case against Philadelphia police officer Mark Dial, who was facing a murder charge for killing 27-year-old Eddie Irizarry last month. The judge dismissing the case at a preliminary hearing today, citing a lack of evidence. How can it be lack of evidence? The evidence is there in your face. The evidence included police body camera videos and this security video that shows Officer Dial and his partner pull Irizarry over for driving erratically. Officer Dial firing six shots within seven seconds of encountering Irizarry. The defense argued the videos show Officer Dial retreating as he was shooting, his partner yelling, he's got a gun. Irizarry did not have a gun, but he did have a knife by his side. Hearing gun, seeing gun, he fired. Um, like I said, it, it's heartbreaking, it's a tragedy, but not a crime. The judge dismissing all charges despite police initially claiming Irizarry was shot outside his car after he, quote, lunged at police. Changing their story after the videos clearly showed Irizarry never left his vehicle. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, what comes next in this case? Well, Lindsay, tonight the DA has already appealed to reinstate the charges, so a hearing is already set for next month. And tonight, Philadelphia's sheriff is urging people to stay calm after this decision. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Our thanks to you. There is a humanitarian crisis at our southern border, and now it's become a law enforcement showdown for Texas Guardsmen and Customs and Border Patrol. Let's head to Maria Villarreal, who's on the ground in Eagle Pass, Texas, for us. Maria, uh, tell us what happened today when CBP showed up. 
You know, earlier today, Lindsay, we saw a lot of presence here by the Texas National Guard. Uh, basically, they were on the other side over my right shoulder. They were reinforcing a lot of the wiring that's here. Uh, and there was a very large group of migrants that was being kept at bay uh, by the wiring and by these guardsmen. Um, I would say after about three or four hours of the group getting larger and larger, uh, Border Patrol Chief Jason Owen showed up on site. Uh, he walked over, he checked things out and then probably within 10 minutes or so we saw border patrol agents again two very separate entities here that we're talking about texas national guard the state of texas and then border patrol which is federal agents basically federal agents with the border patrol grabbed wire cutters went over cut up some wire and basically escorted these migrants onto u.s soil then over underneath the bridge where they will be processed i mean it was the ultimate showdown in in you know the two different entities kind of you know coming to head uh, right in front of us um, and all over what is happening here which is an influx of migrants basically you know you have governor abbott uh, and what he calls you know uh, you know, a crisis here on the border with the large numbers. Um, but then on the other side of the, uh, this argument is the Biden administration saying we are doing as much as we can and we are making headway here. So um, right now it is quiet. We've seen some small groups come through here, but nothing like what we saw earlier today. And how concerned are CBP and DHS officials about the impact of a possible government shutdown with everything happening down there? You know, so I've spoken with a number of Border Patrol agents. Uh, you know, there is concern about the possibility of how this could impact immigration, you know, overall, the entire process. For the most part, the guys on the front line uh, are considered essential workers. So they will continue to work without pay, however, and more than likely they will get paid on the back end. That is exactly what happened in 2019. I think their frustration is right now is, listen, we have so much going on here. A government shutdown could slow down any part of this process and cause an even bigger backup. Uh, on top of that, while the guys on the front line may be considered essential workers, you know, some of the people that are in the administrative staff, in the facilities, in repairs, engineering, those people are not considered essential and, again, could have direct impact on how we are responding to the amount of people that are coming across the border right now. So there is definitely some worry, some concern, and also there is frustration that maybe as we continue to talk about a government shutdown, you know, we're taking our eyes off you know the ball here in 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 trying to figure out a, a long-term solution to what is happening here on the ground in communities like Eagle Pass and we hear that water patrol out there as we speak Maria Villarreal in Eagle Pass Texas our thanks to you as always that possible government shutdown is just four days away, meaning millions of people could go without paychecks, including the military and, of course, the Border Patrol. Speaker Kevin McCarthy's new plan is to introduce a short-term funding bill with border provisions attached. But does he have the votes? ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports in from Capitol Hill. Tonight, Senate Democrats and Republicans coming together to propose a bipartisan spending plan to prevent the government from shutting down in just four days a bridge towards cooperation and away from extremism. It's unclear if that proposal could even pass the House, where a handful of hardline Republicans are standing in the way of a deal. Tonight, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy trying a new tactic to try to win them over, proposing a short-term bill to fund the government that includes provisions to beef up security at the border, including resuming construction on the border wall. Do you have the votes for that? Well, I, would, I wouldn't know who in our own party would want to side and take the position of Biden on the border. I can't think of anyone that would want to do that. Left in limbo, the 4 million federal workers who would see their paychecks stop if the government shuts down. Nearly half are military troops and others who work for the armed forces. Bessa Pinchotti's husband, Dave, works in the Air Force. I have no idea if my husband will get a paycheck. We're just going about our business, hoping that he will, but planning in case he doesn't. Is that frustrating? Absolutely. We're hearing that same frustration from Andy Coakley in Jacksonville, Florida. She served six years in the Coast Guard. Her husband, Joe, is still serving. It's been 23 years for him. Together, they have moved their family around the country at least five times. Why would someone choose to serve their country knowing that the lawmakers don't care enough to make sure that they're going to get paid? I asked one of those Republican hardliners, Congressman Bob Good of Virginia, what he would say to workers who won't get checks if the government shuts down. Well, we have to worry about all 330 million Americans, not just isolated stories and specific individuals. 
So many personally impacted by this. Rachel Scott joins us now. Hey, Rachel, what's the state of play on how potential votes could move forward in both the House and Senate? Yeah, Lindsay, so you got this bipartisan deal in the Senate that was just released moments ago. But if those bipartisan leaders were hoping for overwhelming enthusiasm from Republicans in the House, not so fast. I can tell you, I was just texting with a member who said that they should take that proposal and toss it in the trash. They do not support it. And it's unclear Speaker McCarthy will even bring that proposal to the floor for a vote in the House. So the bottom line here, four days out from a government shutdown, and there's still no clear path forward, Lindsay. Talking about tossing plans into the trash. All right, Rachel Scott for us from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. A growing number of Senate Democrats are calling on Senator Bob Menendez to resign. This push for resignation comes after a federal grand jury returned a sweeping indictment against the New Jersey senator. The Senate has returned back to the Capitol for the first time since Menendez was indicted on bribery charges. Fellow New Jersey Democrat Senator Cory Booker says Menendez should resign his seat. Booker called the allegations against Menendez hard to reconcile. Next to an ABC News exclusive on the special counsel probe looking into President Biden's alleged mishandling of classified documents, tonight we have what sources are now telling ABC News about the scope of this investigation, which is ongoing, and the long list of who's been interviewed. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, sources tell ABC News the special counsel investigating President Biden's alleged mishandling of classified documents has already interviewed as many as 100 witnesses, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken. It's a first glimpse into the sprawling investigation largely kept under wraps since the appointment of the special counsel way back in January. I'm here today to announce the appointment of Robert Herr as a special counsel. It was in the public interest to appoint a special counsel. The investigation launched after President Biden turned over classified documents his team discovered in his old office in a Washington think tank, the documents dating back from his years in the Obama administration. FBI agents then searching his home in Delaware, uncovering more documents stored in a garage, searching his beach home as well. No documents turned up there. The total number of classified documents in question, about 25. People know... I take classified documents and classified material seriously. I also said we're cooperating fully and completely with the Justice Department's review. Sources telling ABC News that for nearly nine months, FBI agents and federal prosecutors have interviewed scores of former Biden aides, from executive assistants to military aides, to senior advisors, including Blinken, who was Biden's national security advisor during President Obama's first term. They've gathered materials dating back from the early days of the Obama administration, including email chains dating back to at least 2010. Sources tell us witnesses have also been pressed about the use of filing cabinets and safes. Some witnesses interviewed by the FBI tell ABC News they were left with the impression that while investigators uncovered instances of carelessness, they seemed to be more like mistakes than criminal acts. Pierre Thomas joins us now. And Pierre, some witnesses say that they believe and investigators see this as more of a mistake than a crime. What are your sources inside the DOJ telling you? Well, the special counsel really is operating in silence, but I'm told this investigation is active, ongoing, far from over. So we should not draw any conclusions mm. just yet. All right. Pierre Thomas, great to have you in here as always. New York officials say the fugitive husband at the center of that daycare horror in the Bronx has been captured in Mexico. Felix Garcia was arrested 24 hours after police released surveillance images showing him carrying two full shopping bags away from the crime scene. Many children suffered from exposure to fentanyl, with three children being revived by Narcan, and sadly a one-year-old boy also died. The daycare owner and two other suspects are also under arrest. We turn now to the Federal Trade Commission and 17 states today announcing that they are suing Amazon, claiming the online retail giant is a monopoly that controls what products are sold on its platform, how much they charge for them, and then also owns the shipping and delivery network that sellers are pressured to use. For more on this lawsuit and what it could mean for American consumers, we're joined now by ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus. So, uh, Alexis, thanks so much for coming on. Explain what this lawsuit is alleging. 
Well, we were expecting this to come down for quite some time, and now here it is. So the suit is alleging that Amazon uses its dominance in the industry to keep prices artificially high, to harm its rivals, and to keep third-party vendors locked into its platform. So specifically, they're claiming that Amazon punishes vendors if they offer their products for a lower price on a competing website. They also are forcing or allegedly forcing these vendors to use their logistics, their warehousing, their shipping at a higher cost in order to get, um, you know, preferential treatment on the platform to be successful on the platform. Now, Amazon has called this lawsuit misguided, claiming right. that they actually help, they don't hurt the businesses. Explain their side of this. So for its part, Amazon is saying that the FTC is wrong on both the facts and the law. They're saying that they actually help to spur competition and innovation in the retail industry, that they're giving consumers greater selection at a better price. Um, also, you know, the head of the FTC, Linda Kahn, who's bringing this suit, has a long time history of being a critic uh, of Amazon. In fact, she wrote a paper uh, for the Yale Law Journal a few years back being very um, critical of Amazon, saying that it was anti-competitive. But her anti-competitive views don't always sit well with the courts. A couple of cases she brought, namely against Microsoft and Facebook's parent company, Meta, uh, were thrown out. And so big picture for us, what does this mean ultimately for the businesses who use Amazon and also the consumers? I think in the short short term and perhaps even in the long term, not much. It's hard to win an antitrust case in the United States. If you look back at history, decades ago, uh, the government tried to break up Microsoft. Uh, they failed. Uh, Linda Kahn is not making clear whether or not she wants to break up Amazon as part of this case. Um, but uh, at least in the short term, the government wants to get an injunction against Amazon. That's going to be a, a hard fight. So I don't think consumers or vendors will feel any difference, mm. at least as this makes its way through the courts. All right, really interesting stuff. Alexis Christophers, always appreciate you breaking it down for us. My pleasure, <laughs> thanks. And still ahead, terrifying video shows the moment a family says a fast food worker fired a gun at them in a drive through the action they're now taking. The next group of New Jersey fishermen are headed to the Supreme Court this fall, hoping to reel in government power as they challenge a requirement that they pay for federal inspectors on their boats. So on some trips, the observer could be the highest paid person. Without, without a doubt. So at some point, I may not make a herring trip if I got a, you know, take a monitor and pay for them because it might not be worth it to me and my crew. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. For nearly 50 years, America's herring fishermen have been required to take federal inspectors on their boats when they go out to sea. 
But recently, the government went a step further, asking them to pay their salaries as well. The move has prompted a major legal battle, and at the Supreme Court this fall, the fishermen will ask the justices to reel in government power in a big way. In tonight's Prime Focus, our Devin Dwyer takes a look at the stakes, which could stretch far beyond the ocean. This is the radar that helps that, you find the fish, essentially. More or less, it looks straight under the boat and it sees whatever's under the boat. In Cape May, New Jersey, the hunt for North Atlantic herring is a family affair. You've been doing this for years, you love it. Yeah, and I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> Stephen Axelson's grandfather emigrated here from Sweden in 1954, helping his seaside community blossom into a base for small family fishing businesses. The waters off the coast are home to schools of long thin squid and Atlantic herring, a fish used for food and as bait for lobsters. This would be a similar today to what we're working in this. Bill Bright has been in the herring business here for 40 years. To actually be a good fisherman, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If you need financial security, fishing is not for you. How many herring and pounds will you each catch this year, you think? Maybe, maybe a million pounds. But on a good year before, we would catch 10 million pounds. Higher insurance rates and fuel costs have eaten into profit margins. And shrinking stocks of fish, likely caused by climate change, mean dramatically lower government caps on what they can catch. The government says that the herring fishery is overfished. Do you agree with that? I wouldn't agree with that now. I mean, nobody has more invested than me and Steve, and nobody cares more about this fishery, and nobody cares more about the ocean than we do. Since 1976, federal marine observers like these have been put on commercial fishing vessels to collect data to help set fishing guidelines. It's they're happening. taking notes. They're taking, they're taking notes, notes on what type of fish you're bringing in, well, how they're much taking, you're they're back. taking in what time you set, where you set, where you haul, how much tow wire you have, and then they're actually, then they actually take how much you have and what you have. For sometimes days at sea, they're in close quarters with the fishermen. And when I find the fish, they're almost like firemen. They have to respond instantly. Even sharing bunk beds in a tiny cabin. So they're right in with your guys. Right in with the guys. Three years ago, federal regulators looking to expand coverage of observers at sea moved to require some herring fishermen to directly pay observer salaries up to $700 a day. We don't mind taking observers. You know, we, we have for decades now. But to be told to pay for it just isn't right. By one estimate, that could top 20% of the revenue of a fisherman's catch, which is never a guarantee. So on some trips, the observer could be the highest paid person. Without, the without a doubt. So at some point, I may not make a herring trip if I got to, you know, take a monitor and pay for them because it might not be worth it to me and my crew. Bright and Axelson say the rule could drive them out of business. Congress never mentioned explicitly in the law anything about having them pay observers' salaries. You're worried about the government forcing more fishermen to pay for their own inspectors. Me and everybody around me is concerned about that, highly concerned about that, because the margins are so tight right now. The fishermen turned for help to one of the country's most experienced Supreme Court lawyers, Paul Clement, who's argued over 100 cases. This fall, he'll ask the justices to strike down the policy. So if Congress thinks this is really important that there be a monitor on every ship, well, then it can pay for a monitor on every ship. Congress did give regulators at the National Marine Fisheries Service the power to set rules as may be necessary to do their jobs. The government argues in court documents that broad language implicitly allows the agency to have fishermen pay their observers. We don't want Congress trying to figure out the nitty-gritty details of literally everything. Meredith Moore is with the Ocean Conservancy and sits on the nation's Marine Fisheries Advisory Committee. Congress has delegated these sorts of authorities to um, the federal agencies to be experts and make sure that we're protecting human health and safety and the environment. Is it fair for fishermen, in your view, to have to pay the salaries of these observers? I think it's perfectly in line with the authorities that the government has to figure out how to share those burdens. If the fishermen win, it could have a major impact far beyond the ocean.
This is really about the government without express authorization from Congress imposing some additional huge costs on the industry. Clement says the government's entire system of regulations from public health to environmental protection, even tax collection, gives federal agencies too much power not directly approved by Congress. So this is about gray areas. This is about gray areas, but the problem is once you say that there are gray areas and then there's a different rule, people start seeing gray everywhere. For nearly 40 years, the Supreme Court has said in disputes over federal regulations that judges should defer to policy experts when the law is unclear. The practice has become known as the Chevron Doctrine, named after the 1984 case. Several of the court's conservatives want it overturned. I do think that if you got rid of Chevron, you would essentially force You'd make the executive branch a little less powerful. You'd make the other two branches a little more powerful. So what we could lose with this case is the grounding of our government in expertise and science in the way that we interpret laws all over the country. Now we're taking the fish out of the sea. And As Bill Bright prepares for herring season in November and Stephen Axelson games out the biggest catch. Sometimes they move and you gotta go find them again. Both men say their minds will be on the Supreme Court. Just don't expect to see them there. Are you both going to be in Washington when this uh, when this thing is heard? You think? Or are you going to no, just I'll take be, it in from? I'll out probably here? be fishing. We'll probably be fishing. <laughs> Far-reaching implications there. Thanks to Devin Dwyer for bringing us that. So much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. J.P. Morgan is ordered to pay out millions of dollars. The involvement with Jeffrey Epstein that led the U.S. Virgin Islands to file a lawsuit. But next, the nation's homeless crisis is seeing record highs. We'll break down what the data shows by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I like to think I'm rebel, I'm revolutionary. I like to think I like to bring change. Tupac, Tupac, Tupac Shakur. The Tupac case is simple. There's not going to be anybody charged with his murder because the shooter is dead. This morning, new developments in one of the biggest cold cases in modern pop culture history. Are you kidding me? Thank you very much. Who shot Pac? The murder of Tupac Shakur on the season premiere of Impact, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime.
time. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The U.S. is seeing a record rise in homelessness this year. Advocates say rising housing costs, a lack of affordable rental units, and the continuing opioid crisis are sending more people than ever into the streets. The Wall Street Journal recently reviewed the early data, and here's what they found by the numbers. The number of homeless people is up 11 percent from last year. That's the biggest increase since the government started tracking the issue back in 2007. For comparison, the next highest increase was 2.7 percent in 2019. The journal got its numbers by reviewing data from more than 300 organizations that track the number of homeless in their local areas. Even with some of the organization's numbers outstanding, they tallied 577,000 homeless people in the U.S. Here's a snapshot of what they found across the country. Denver reported a 32 percent increase in homeless people. In New Orleans, the number of homeless increased almost 15 percent. In Los Angeles County, reports a nearly 10 percent increase from last year. Some places like New York City, which reported nearly 83,000 people in shelters, have said an influx of refugees is inflating homeless counts. And a Princeton University survey of evictions in more than 30 cities found they're up nearly everywhere, further fueling the rise in homelessness. The federal government uses the same method for their homeless census. Their numbers are due later this year. The government's Interagency Council on Homelessness blamed the rising numbers on housing costs and shortages, but they said the early count does not reflect the Biden administration administration's recent efforts to try to tackle the issue. And ABC's Zareen Shah will have a look at how the debate over addressing homelessness in California is playing out on the campaign trail tomorrow night here on Prime. And we still have much more ahead tonight. You may be experiencing panic attacks and not even realize it. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman tells us how he struggled for years and how he started on the path to healing. And it's the time of year many look forward to autumn and pumpkin season, but there may be some setbacks for pumpkin lovers this year. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. Video shows the moment a family says a fast food restaurant worker shot a gun at them over curly fries. A bank will pay out millions at a settlement over its ties to Jeffrey Epstein. And you may have some trouble finding the perfect pumpkin this fall. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. <laughs> A family who was shot at in a drive through is suing fast food chain Jack in the Box, accusing it of not keeping customers safe from dangerous employees. Newly released surveillance video shows a Jack in the Box employee opening fire on the family's car. The driver's pregnant wife and six-year-old daughter were in the car at the time. They ordered a combo meal from the fast food chain, but the curly fries were missing, leading to an argument with the restaurant staff. Moments later, police say an employee pulled the trigger, firing at least two shots at the car. She pleaded guilty to a charge of deadly conduct. No one was injured, and the company denies all allegations made against it in the lawsuit. J.P. Morgan Chase agreeing to pay $75 million to the U.S. Virgin Islands to settle claims that the bank enabled Jeffrey Epstein to commit sex trafficking on the estate he had there for years. The bank saying it regrets any association with Epstein and did not know he was using the bank to commit heinous crimes. Some of the settlement money will be donated to organizations that help victims of human trafficking. The bank also settled a similar lawsuit earlier in the year for $290 million brought by survivors of Epstein's abuse. Epstein died by suicide in a federal jail in 2019. New York City is asking a judge to change the mandate that requires the city to provide shelter to anyone who asks for it. They're aiming to limit the amount of time migrants can stay in city-run facilities. Advocacy groups fighting back saying more people will sleep in the streets if a change is made. Meanwhile, Governor Hochul siding with the mayor, and she yesterday announced the deployment of an additional 150 guardsmen to help. Baltimore police are investigating the death of a 26-year-old tech CEO as a homicide. Pava Marie LaPere, who ran the tech company Ecomap, was named in Forbes 30 Under 30 list and attended Johns Hopkins, where she launched the startup as a student. LaPere was found in an apartment complex, and police say there were signs of blunt force trauma. Baltimore police is investigating the case as a homicide. According to new figures from the CDC, long COVID affected 6.9% of adults in the U.S., women more frequently than men, and people outside of large central metro areas were more likely to experience long COVID. The impact has been lower for children. About 1.3% of children have ever been affected. But among kids, data shows 12 to 17-year-olds were most likely to be affected by long COVID symptoms, and Hispanic children have been most affected. From New Jersey to Kentucky and all the way down to Texas, farmers are battling a whole host of conditions, squashing those perfect pumpkin dreams. But experts say despite the fright, it's not dire everywhere, especially in Illinois, the largest pumpkin producing state in the country. And at Happy Day Farms in Manalapan, New Jersey, despite a short drought that set their crops back three weeks, they say their pumpkins are now perfect for picking. 
Panic attacks. Many people have them and don't even realize it. It's something our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, struggled with for years, and he's only going public about it now in his new book, No Time to Panic. We sat down with him for an intimate conversation about his struggles and what he ultimately decided to do to move forward. I can't think of a better title than No Time to Panic. So here you are, this courageous, fearless world traveler. Not very much a, a chaotic scene. Reporting on some of the, the biggest events of, of our lifetime. Are you prepared for confrontation if it has to happen? And you're suffering with, with panic attacks and, and anxiety. When was the first moment that you felt that and you were able to identify it as such? Two different things, right? The first time I experienced panic, that full-on underwear wedding, I'm molting into a werewolf experience was in college defending my thesis. And I got up to the podium and it felt like the floor had fallen out. I was gripping the podium with this white knuckled grip and I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't do anything. Um, but it took 15 years for me to actually recognize that that suite of symptoms that I had experienced was actually a panic attack. Partly because I just chalked it up as nerves and I went through it in radio and then in television. And I'm like, oh, that's just nerves. But it would leave me just completely racked and wrecked afterwards. And so when did you realize, oh, that's what this is? I mean, it was probably in 2013. It's actually when Dan Harris told me about his book. Mm. I sat down in Dan Harris's office and he started describing this book and what it's about. And I said, that's a panic attack? That, that's me. I get that almost every time I go on air. And then what did you do? I kept it secret. I couldn't tell anyone. I mean, having panic when you're live on television as a broadcast reporter is like a free solo climber being afraid of heights. It is a major professional liability. So I... I kept it secret. I didn't tell anybody. My wife knew. Um, my shrink knew, although we didn't really tackle it head on. Um, and at that point, I just tried to subdue it with everything that I could. I mean, I had magical underwear in the rotation. I had, uh, I smoked cigarettes before live shots sometimes. I would do stretching. I would just arrive really, really late so there wouldn't be any pressure. Um, anything to try to like change up the rhythm of that intense pressure that I felt. And so you go to therapy, you try even hallucinogens, you go to retreats in, in Peru. Did any of the these methods work? I, I wouldn't just like, there's one thing that's sort of interesting, right? People ask, well, Matt, you, you're like by definition a courageous person, right? We've seen you, you go to war zones, you love it. And I feel more calm when everything is chaos around me than I am when it's this pristine live shot and nothing is happening and I'm expected to be flawless. It's that fear of the expectation of perfection that makes me crumble. Mm. And so it all came tumbling down for me when I had to go report on the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash. January 26, 2020, I made a catastrophic mistake during a panic attack on air. And for years, I'd been telling my wife that I was unhappy. Um, and she had supported me in thinking about maybe doing something else. Because so, your job requires you to be cool and calm, not panic. Right. And so I never had a problem, right? I had never made a mistake. But my fear was that I would lose control and make a mistake. And then it happened. And that was shattering for me. And so I was suspended for a month. And during that suspension, I started doing different things because suspension has a way of opening up your schedule. So I did something called holotropic breath work. And it takes you to an altered state, basically. And I started crying. And it opened me up in a way that I hadn't expected. I talked to you when you first uh, talked about uh, the book coming out on, on social media. And, and, and gave you this admission because it, it felt good to know. Like I knew about Dan Harris, I had had conversations with him and then I, I was like, oh my gosh, and Matt too? You know, I think that it um, can uh, allow us all to feel safe, right? When you know that you're not the only one. But it's not something that I, I talk about often and I, I'm curious what made you decide to to be so vulnerable. It's one thing to talk behind closed doors in an office. It's another to say, I'm Matt Gutman and I suffer from panic attacks and, and here's my life story. 
I didn't really, first of all, I was so moved and grateful that you were willing to share with me your story. And I thought the same thing. I'm like, Lindsay? <laughs> Come on, Lindsay Davis? You have the most presence and centeredness of almost anybody in this business. But people are surprised that people like us experience panic. And that's one of the reasons I had to share it. Because so many people out there do. The science, the data from 2006 shows that 28% of Americans are likely to experience a panic attack in their lifetime. In 2006, I had already experienced panic for six years. I would never have known to answer the survey correctly because I didn't even know to diagnose myself. I didn't know that I had panic. So psychologists believe the real number is probably about 50% of Americans will experience a panic attack in their lifetime. And the symptoms so closely mimic a heart attack that it has a serious knock-on effect on our healthcare system. If there's one takeaway that you want people to, to have when, if they read or get the chance to, to take a look at No Time to Panic, what would it be? There are two, maybe three. Okay. One, panic is normal. Panic is pervasive. So many people have it. We are designed for it. And three, it's not a life sentence. There are ways around it, and there are ways to live with it. And you detail that in No Time to Panic. Thank you, Matt. It's so refreshing for people to be able to have this, this honest conversation, because as you say, there are so many, me included, who feel like, oh, is it safe to talk about it? And, and so I thank you for pulling back the curtain. Thank you. I mean, and the other thing that I would say that is so important, and I think you just brought it up, is stripping away the shame. Matt's book, No Time to Panic, is now available wherever books are sold. We thank him for the conversation. Tomorrow, seven GOP hopefuls will be on stage for the second Republican debate at the Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Former Vice President Mike Pence will be there, and he is kind enough to join us now. Vice President, thank you so much for your time. You bet, Lindsay. Good to be with you. A new poll out today from Monmouth University asked voters who they'd like to see as a Republican nominee for president in 2024. Only 1% chose you in our polling averages. Your numbers have stayed flat since the last debate. What do you plan on doing differently tomorrow night? Well, we're just going to continue to work hard and we're going to continue to present my message that uh, after four years as vice president, four years as a governor of a conservative state, uh, 12 years in the Congress of the United States where I led House conservatives, that I'm simply the most qualified, the most consistent conservative in this race. And, and I have to tell you, Lindsay, I think it's, it's real early. You know, we've been spending a fair amount of time in New Hampshire and in Iowa, and uh, I, I ran into a wonderful woman just the other day. She walked up to me and she said, you know, it, it's, it's good to see you again. I'm still undecided. I've only met you three times. And uh, you know, these early states, they take their time. We're going to go out there and earn it. And, uh, but I still believe that the majority of Republicans want us to stay on that time-honored, tested, mainstream conservative agenda that really has defined our party since, since Ronald Reagan came to the White House in January of 1981. People will, people will hear me last night reflecting on how Ronald Reagan drew me to the Republican Party. That's the message that we're continuing to deliver, not only on the airwaves, on the debate stage, but uh, all across Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and all across the country. Does former President Trump owe it to voters to be on that stage tomorrow? Well, I, I think he owes it to voters to, to, to answer the tough questions and, uh, and, and to share his vision for where we lead this country out of the failed policies of the Biden administration. Look, we, you know, we, we had the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. We have the worst border crisis in history. Inflation is ravaging the family budgets of millions of Americans. And, uh, and I think one thing that I've tried to make clear to people is when Donald Trump ran in 2016, Lindsay, he promised to govern as a conservative. And we did govern as conservatives all all those four years, but uh, Donald Trump makes no such promise today. I mean, where, where we stood for strong American leadership in the world, he and some of his imitators are, are sounding uh, the words of isolation and appeasement as war rages in Eastern Europe, where we cut taxes 
across the board under our administration. Donald Trump now advocates uh, what would be a, the, one of the largest tax increases in history, a 10 percent tariff on all imports into the country. And where we stood without apology for the right to life, Donald Trump now has taken to criticizing states that uh, advance protections for the unborn at the point at which an unborn child can experience pain. So I, I think the Donald Trump today is different uh, than the Donald Trump of 2016. And you bet, I think he ought to be on that debate stage. He ought to be engaging all of us that are vying for this nomination. He ought to be sharing his vision. But for my part, I'm going to continue to share a vision of, of, uh, of a tested, proven conservative that knows those same ideas, those ideas we governed on, those ideas that Ronald Reagan brought forward and brought America back uh, in the 1980s. They're the ideas that are going to bring America back today. We just learned today a New York judge has ruled former President Trump committed systemic fraud, lying for years about his net worth by inflating the value of his real estate portfolio. Is this a fair issue for you to bring up on the campaign trail? Well, I, 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 I'm not familiar with the judge's ruling, but I, I, think, uh, I think judgments about, uh, about the president, uh, you know, can be made by any American. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, I, I have to tell you, I just don't hear very much. Uh, about any of the legal controversies swirling around the president. And I do hear people very concerned uh, about the future of this country, about, about inflation, about Joe Biden's war on energy, about a crisis at the border that's seen more than six million people come into this country in the last two and a half years. And now even you have places, you have places like New York City that are waking up to the crisis at our border. So, you know, I, look, anybody on that stage can bring up any issues they want. I'm going to be focused on the issues the American people are focused on and the fact that I'm committed to bringing those conservative solutions that have defined our party over the last 50 years to bear on it, while Donald Trump and others uh, are, uh, are following a siren song of populism and, and want to lead our party uh, to a whole different range of policies that, that I, think, uh, I think will ill-serve of the nation as we try and find our way out of the, the failures of the Biden administration. One of those issues, obviously, as you know, former President Trump has called abortion bans at six weeks, like the one in Florida, quote, terrible mistake. Do you think former President Trump still represents the GOP base's values on abortion? Well, it's, it's part of what I mentioned earlier, Lindsay, is, uh, you know, I'm pro-life. I don't apologize for it. I, I couldn't be more proud to have played a role in the administration that appointed three of the justices uh, that sent Roe versus Wade to the ash heap of history and, and, and returned the question of abortion to the states and the American people. Uh, but, but for Donald Trump to, uh, to describe a, a positive pro-life bill, a heartbeat bill, that not, not only passed in Florida but in Georgia and in Ohio, in Iowa, to describe that as a terrible mistake, I think is a real betrayal and a disservice to millions of pro-life Americans who have longed to advance the sanctity of life. I want people to know if I'm president of the United States, they're going to have a champion for the right to life uh, in, the, in the Oval Office. And, and, uh, and, and I'll always honor all of those that are protecting, protecting the unborn in our nation. Today, President Biden, as you know, took the unprecedented step of joining a union picket line. Do you think that that's appropriate for a president to do so? Well, I, look, it's it's free country. Uh, Joe Biden can go to the picket line and and grab a bullhorn and uh, and and talk about his support for members of the UAW. But I got to tell you, you know, I come from the second leading manufacturing state in the country. I, I know an awful lot about the automotive business. We're proud of it in the state of Indiana, Lindsay. And and look, uh, I think what's putting those people on on the picket line is not the class warfare politics you're hearing about. I think it's at Bidenomics has failed. Wages are not keeping up with inflation and auto workers know it just like all American workers. And frankly, they also know that those electric vehicle mandates and subsidies of the Biden administration in the Green New Deal really threatened to crush the entire gasoline power automotive industry in this country. And so my, my hope, was, I heard he didn't stick around very long on the picket line. And maybe there was a reason for that. You know, I figured if he started talking to some of those UAW members, they might have pulled him aside when the cameras weren't rolling and saying, hey, can, can, we, can we come off the accelerator on, uh, on this aggressive electric vehicle agenda that's, that's uh, it's good for Beijing, but it's bad for Detroit. And uh, I really do believe that that's the issue that's driving 
that's the issue that's driving that strike. And if I'm president, well, we're going we're gonna to go back to an all of the above energy strategy. We're going we're gonna to be source neutral on energy. We're going to get rid of this Green New Deal and their subsidies and mandates. And I've got a plan to tackle inflation that will get wages back, back up and above inflation in a short period of time. Just have about a minute left, uh, Mr. Vice President. As you know, in her new book, Enough, former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson claims former President Donald Trump repeated the Hang Mike Pence chant along with rioters as he was watching the January 6th Capitol insurrection. What's your reaction to that? Well, I wasn't there. I, I have no idea what was happening at the West Wing. I was, I stayed at my post that day. You know, I really do believe, by God's grace, I did my duty that day and, and kept my oath to the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I, and, and I must tell you that uh, whatever happened down uh, at the White House, I know that what we did that day, what law enforcement did quelling that riot and making it possible for us to reconvene the Congress the very same day and complete our work under the Constitution of the United States. It took a day of tragedy and made it a triumph of freedom, and I'll never see it any other way. If I can, just get a yes or no in the limited time that we have. Yes or no to the government shutdown. Do you think that it's something that's avoidable? Well, I, you know, we went through the longest government shutdown uh, in history when, when we were in office, and I was the lead negotiator for the administration. Look, spending is out of control in Washington, D.C. I commend House Republicans for digging in. But I think at the end of the day, uh, we, we've got to have leadership in the White House and in the Congress that deals with the real drivers of our national debt. We have, we have $33 trillion national debt, and entitlements are driving that. If I'm president of the United States, we'll, we'll find a way to fund the government and find savings on the margins. But we're going to take on common sense reforms for entitlements to save our children and grandchildren from a mountain range of debt. Former Vice President Mike Pence, always appreciate you coming on. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to be with you. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, weeks after an injunction stopped it from taking effect, a federal judge weighs in on a controversial law that restricted drag shows in Texas. Heavy rains cause a river to burst its banks, creating a deadly situation. The desperate search now for the missing. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and, of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including... For the first time, an American president joined striking workers as President Biden rallies with UAW members in Michigan, plus a surprise court ruling with a judge dropping all charges against a police officer in the deadly shooting of a driver in Philadelphia, and a possible government shutdown now just four days away, meaning millions of people could go without a paycheck. We'll have the latest on Speaker Kevin McCarthy's new plan to try to keep the government open. But we begin with developing news. A judge has ruled that former President Trump committed systemic fraud, lying for years about his net worth by inflating the value of his real estate portfolio. The former president was accused, along with his two eldest sons and their family real estate business, of inflating properties, including his Fifth Avenue apartment by as much as $200 million and of Mar-a-Lago in Florida by as much as $600 million. In bringing the suit, New York Attorney General Letitia James accused Trump and his business of overstating their net worth by as much as $2.2 billion. The former 
former president has continued to deny any wrongdoing, but the evidence in the judge's eyes was so overwhelming, there does not even need to be a trial. So what happens next? Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, leads us off. Tonight, a judge in New York has determined former President Trump committed systemic fraud, lying for years about his net worth by inflating the value of his real estate portfolio. The fraud was so overwhelming, the judge decided there was no need for him to even hear evidence or testimony at a civil trial set to begin next month. The judge found Trump inflated the value of his Fifth Avenue apartment in Trump Tower by as much as $200 million by claiming it was triple its actual size. Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million when the judge said the Palm Beach estate's assessed value was no more than $27 million. The judge agreeing with New York Attorney General Letitia James, Trump overstated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion, duping banks, insurance companies, and other business partners into giving Trump, his eldest sons, and their family real estate business better terms than deserved. Trump has consistently denied wrongdoing and has attacked the attorney general and her case. But tonight, the judge rejected each of Trump's defenses, calling them bogus and deceptive, and saying at one point Trump's denials were straight out of, quote, fantasy world. Our thanks to Aaron for that. And we turn now to President Biden, who made history today as the first sitting president to ever walk the picket line in a labor dispute, joining striking auto workers in Michigan. The president grabbed a bullhorn to back the UAW, telling them to, quote, stick with it for a significant raise and other benefits. ABC's Terry Moran was there in Wayne, Michigan, and has the latest. President Biden made history today as the first president ever to walk the picket line. In a show of solidarity with auto workers. You've heard me say it many times. Wall Street didn't build the country. The middle class built the country. Yeah. Yeah. Unions yeah. built the middle class. Yeah. That's, a That's a fact. So let's keep going. You deserve sure. what you've earned, and you've earned a hell of a lot more than you're getting paid now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. The United Auto Workers are fighting for expanded benefits, shorter hours, and a 40% pay raise over the next four years, which they say matches pay raises for the car company's CEOs. And today, the president, breaking with the practice of his predecessors, openly sided with the workers. Stick with it. You deserve the significant raise you need and other benefits. Let's get it. Get back we lost, okay? Yeah. Afterwards, we talked with Carolyn Nippa, who works in inventory at the GM parts distribution facility where Biden joined the picket line. And what does it mean that the president came here to stand with you on the picket line? I mean, it, it means a lot. I mean, it got, I think it's going to bring a lot of attention to our cause. Um, it's going to get attention of the CEOs that he's here, he's with us, he's standing with us. The UAW hasn't endorsed a candidate for president yet, but today the head of the union was enthusiastically grateful. Thank you to the president. Thank you, Mr. President, for coming. Thank you for coming to stand up with us in our generation's defining moment. Our thanks to Terry Moran. A dramatic scene played out in Philadelphia court after a judge dismissed all charges against a police officer who fatally shot a driver during a traffic stop. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is there. Tonight, a stunning turn in the case against Philadelphia police officer Mark Dial, who was facing a murder charge for killing 27-year-old Eddie Irizarry last month. The judge dismissing the case at a preliminary hearing today, citing a lack of evidence. How can it be lack of evidence? The evidence is there in your face. The evidence included police body camera videos and this security video that shows Officer Dial and his partner pull Irizarry over for driving erratically. Officer Dial firing six shots within seven seconds of encountering Irizarry. The defense argued the videos show Officer Dial retreating as he was shooting, his partner yelling, he's got a gun. Irizarry did not have a gun, but he did have a knife by his side. Hearing gun, seeing gun, he fired. Um, like I said, it, it's heartbreaking, it's a tragedy, 
but not a crime. The judge dismissing all charges despite police initially claiming Irizarry was shot outside his car after he, quote, lunged at police, changing their story after the videos clearly showed Irizarry never left his vehicle. Our thanks to Stephanie. A potential mass shooting at a Virginia church may have been thwarted by a tip. Authorities say the alleged attacker posted threatening messages online, and he was found within three hours inside the church in Haymarket, Virginia. That's where Alex Perche is tonight. Tonight, police say they foiled a potential mass shooting at a Virginia church with just moments to spare. This was a thwarted, diabolical plot to kill churchgoers in Haymarket, Virginia. Authorities say 35-year-old Rui Jang staked out the Park Valley Church about 40 miles west of Washington, D.C. early Sunday morning and posted threatening messages on social media. Around 7.40 a.m., a concerned community member calling in a tip to police who immediately started searching for their suspect. What she saw concerned her enough to call the Anne Arundel County Police Department and say, hey, I think something really bad is going to happen. An off-duty officer working security at the church heard the call and quickly apprehended Jang in the church vestibule, the congregation already inside. We put our hands on him literally in the nick of time. Officials arresting Jang less than three hours after that initial tip, saying he was heavily armed with a loaded handgun and additional magazines and two knives, police also discovering disturbing writings at his home. The pastor telling ABC affiliate WJLA. It was a classic example of people that saw something, said something. Alex Prashay joins us now. Alex, does the suspect have any connections to this church? Lindsay, police say the suspect outlined why he chose this church in writings, but he has no known connection to any of its members. And tonight he is charged with threats of bodily harm and also with carrying a dangerous weapon into a religious place of worship. Lindsay. Alex, thank you. New York officials say the fugitive husband at the center of that daycare horror in the Bronx has been captured in Mexico. Felix Garcia was arrested 24 hours after police released surveillance images showing him carrying two full shopping bags away from the crime scene. Many children suffered from exposure to fentanyl with three children being revived with Narcan. And sadly, a one-year-old boy also died. The daycare owner and two other suspects are also under arrest. A possible government shutdown is now just four days away, meaning millions of people could go without paychecks, including the military and, of course, Border Patrol. Speaker Kevin McCarthy's new plan is to introduce a short-term funding bill with border provisions attached. But does he have the votes? ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports from Capitol Hill. Tonight, Senate Democrats and Republicans coming together to propose a bipartisan spending plan to prevent the government from shutting down in just four days. A bridge towards cooperation and away from extremism. It's unclear if that proposal could even pass the House, where a handful of hardline Republicans are standing in the way of a deal. Tonight, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy trying a new tactic to try to win them over, proposing a short-term bill to fund the government that includes provisions to beef up security at the border, including resuming construction on the border wall. Do you have the votes for that? Well, I, would, I wouldn't know who in our own party would want to side and take the position of Biden on the border. I can't think of anyone that would want to do that. Left in limbo, the 4 million federal workers who would see their paychecks stop if the government shuts down. Nearly half are military troops and others who work for the armed forces. Bessa Pinchotti's husband, Dave, works in the Air Force. I have no idea if my husband will get a paycheck. We're just going about our business, hoping that he will, but planning in case he doesn't. Is that frustrating? Absolutely. We're hearing that same frustration from Andy Coakley in Jacksonville, Florida. She served six years in the Coast Guard. Her husband, Joe, is still serving. It's been 23 years for him. Together, they have moved their family around the country at least five times. Why would someone choose to serve their country knowing that the lawmakers don't care enough to make sure that they're going to get paid? I asked one of those Republican hardliners, Congressman Bob Good of Virginia, what he would say to workers who won't get checks if the government shuts down. Well, we have to worry about all 330 million Americans, not just isolated stories and specific individuals. Our thanks to Rachel for that. And we go next to an ABC News exclusive on the special counsel probe looking into President Biden's alleged mishandling of classified documents. Tonight, we have that sources are now telling ABC News about the scope of this investigation, which is ongoing, and the long list of people who've been interviewed. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. 
Tonight, sources tell ABC News the special counsel investigating President Biden's alleged mishandling of classified documents has already interviewed as many as 100 witnesses, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken. It's a first glimpse into the sprawling investigation largely kept under wraps since the appointment of the special counsel way back in January. I'm here today to announce the appointment of Robert Herr as a special counsel. It was in the public interest to appoint a special counsel. The investigation launched after President Biden turned over classified documents his team discovered in his old office in a Washington think tank, the documents dating back from his years in the Obama administration. FBI agents then searching his home in Delaware, uncovering more documents stored in a garage. Searching his beach home as well, no documents turned up there. The total number of classified documents in question, about 25. People know I take classified documents and classified material seriously. I also said we're cooperating fully and completely with the Justice Department's review. Sources telling ABC News that for nearly nine months, FBI agents and federal prosecutors have interviewed scores of former Biden aides, from executive assistants to military aides, to senior advisors, including Blinken, who was Biden's national security advisor during President Obama's first term. They've gathered materials dating back from the early days of the Obama administration, including email chains dating back to at least 2010. Sources tell us witnesses have also been pressed about the use of filing cabinets and safes. Some witnesses interviewed by the FBI tell ABC News they were left with the impression that while investigators uncovered instances of carelessness, they seemed to be more like mistakes than criminal acts. Our thanks to Pierre. A Texas law that restricted drag shows has been declared unconstitutional. A federal judge has issued a permanent injunction against a Texas bill that restricted sexually oriented performances, which has been criticized for limiting public drag performances in the state. Tennessee was the first state to restrict public drag performances. For Texas, this is now the second law of its kind to be declared unconstitutional. And we saw much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. Suffering children are at the center of so many of the world's conflicts and natural disasters. The executive director of UNICEF joins us to discuss its goals to protect them. But next, Canada's House Speaker resigns amid a major controversy. Why the person he invited to a session honoring the Ukrainian president caused so much backlash. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Heavy rains overnight caused a river in Guatemala's capital to burst its banks, killing at least six people and leaving more than a dozen missing. Multiple homes were swept away after the Las Vacas River, which runs through Guatemala City, overflowed in an area nearly two miles south of downtown. The Speaker of Canada's House of Commons lower chamber said he would quit a few days after he invited and praised a former Nazi in attendance during a session in the House honoring Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky last Friday. The episode played into the narrative promoted by Russia's Putin, who claims he sent his army into Ukraine last year to, quote, demilitarize and denazify the country, a charge Kiev, a charge Kiev and Western allies say is baseless. Singapore successfully disposed of a 220-pound World War II aerial bomb after evacuating more than 4,000 people living nearby. In footage carried by national broadcaster Channel News Asia, the bomb was seen being detonated at a construction site with loud boom. It's believed to be one of the largest wartime explosives discovered in the Southeast Asian city-state. The war relic, which was unearthed last week, had been deemed unsafe to move and had to be disposed of on site by the military. We've seen so many recent disasters, notably the earthquake in Morocco and the flooding in Libya. Children are often at the center of so much of that suffering. UNICEF's executive director, Catherine Russell, joins us now. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you've reported that more than 300,000 children were affected by the flooding in Libya alone. How is UNICEF working to help children impacted by these natural disasters in both Libya as well as Morocco? Well, thank you. And yes, I mean, the, the challenges in Libya and Morocco are, they're very different, but they're really profound for children. Um, you know, what happens in these situations is children are directly impacted. Certainly in Libya, we see that by this incredible flooding that was caused by the, the dams being uh, destroyed. But it's, it, they're, the services that they rely on are so disrupted. So we see children directly impacted because, as you saw from the flooding, many were pushed out into the Mediterranean Sea. It was just a terrible horrifying situation. And then all the services that children rely on, education, health, the rest of it are so compromised by that. Certainly the same uh, in Morocco by the earthquake. So it's, a, it's kind of a double whammy for children, really, because they're directly impacted and then they're impacted because they depend on the services that government provides. And those, in, those services are really dreadfully undermined by the immediate challenges and for months and months afterwards. And let's talk about UNICEF's sustainable development goals, uh, which you hope to hit by 2030. First, explain to us uh, what this plan aims to do. Okay. Well, the sustainable development goals, it sounds a little bit like UN gobbledygook, but the truth is the goals are, are such an impressive framework. International uh, leaders came together and they decided what kind of future they wanted to have. And this is across the board, not just for children, but in terms of education and health care and reducing poverty and trying to say by 2030, what do we want the world to look like? But three things have come together to really make that challenging. One was COVID, which was devastating for children around the world in terms of education, pushing them into poverty, not getting their vaccinations. Second, we see just real challenges because of so many crises around the world. And then the third challenge has been climate which interestingly has had a real impact on children. And the latest report shows that right now two thirds of your child related goals are not on pace to meet their targets. In which areas are you struggling the most in trying to make headway? Yeah, it's a few things. One is on what we call child protection, which is just basic child uh, protection against things like violence and, and child marriage, other really difficult situations that children face around the world. Very devastating for children. Second is on poverty, which has been just a tough nut to crack, honestly. It's just, you know, we see so many families in poverty and the consequences for children, you can imagine, but they're quite dramatic, right? Children have less opportunities. They are are often put into the workforce early, right? They just face real challenges because of poverty. And then third has been education, which has just, you know, we've made progress in getting children into school in the primary age, but after that, it's really tough for children right now. What do you plan to do and, and what can others do in order to try to reach your sustainable development goals by the deadline? 
Yeah. Well, I think the single most important thing is that we need a commitment and po real political will on a part on the part of leaders around the world. The way UNICEF works is we work with every government uh, where we're where we're working, and that's in almost every country in the world, and try to help them do better. And then on top of that, I think for individuals and businesses, the private sector. Everyone needs to see this as an investment in the future of the world, right? Children, it becomes sort of a cliche, right? Children are the future. But you know what? Children are the future, right? And if we don't invest in them, if we don't make sure that they are healthy and educated, that they're protected from the challenges of climate, what sort of world do we have for the, for the future of any country, right? We're all connected to each other. All countries are dependent on each other. And we need to see this investment in children as something that is a priority for every government, every business, and every person in the world, because it's the world we are all leaving for our children as well. Catherine Russell, we thank you so much for the work you're doing and for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And still to come, a Kentucky man has become a role model and an advocate for a major cause, the life-changing accident that led to a new calling. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. After losing both arms in a catastrophic workplace accident, a Kentucky man has managed to become a role model for fellow amputees, and he's also taking up a cause, spreading the word about the importance of workplace safety. I came very close to losing my life. I was a welder fabricator for a little over 21 years. There's a machine called a drywall shredder. I tried to clean this machine out while it's still running instead of uh, using a safety procedure called lockout tagout. As soon as I stuck that screwdriver in that machine, I was caught and didn't even know it. Uh, and as a result, I lost both arms above the elbow. Yeah, I'm one of the luckiest guys you'll ever meet. This is something I do every day. So a lot of bad things happened that morning in order for me to get caught in that machine, but a lot of good things also happened in order for me to, to have survived something like that. Everything, how I dress, how I brush my teeth, how I eat, how I take a shower, how I drive. It's one of my favorite things to do is drive. Everything is completely different. Ten years after my amputation, my brother David called me up and he said, Billy, he said, uh, would you come out here and talk to my guys? This uh, work injury you had and the things you've been through, it, I think it'll uh, help them see that, uh, you know, safety is very important. This took off like a rocket and I've been doing it since 2017. If you see somebody doing something unsafe or about to do something unsafe, please speak up because you really could be saving somebody's limbs or life. I had nothing to go by when I got my first prosthetic, so I promised myself once I got good with these prosthetics, I was going to start filming myself around the house just living life. Hey, everybody, it's Billy P, the bilateral amputee. Putting them on uh, social media, just showing other people how I do things. So I got a tater, I just cut in quarters there. Besides the positivity that I've had and the determination I've had, it's the two teams that stand behind me, the Hanger Clinic and One Call. They're there to back me every step of the way. Not only do I need to be doing my motivational safety speaking, I need to help other amputees. Billy's a legend among amputees. I remember the first amputee that I helped, his name was Bill. He's done great things again. Uh, he has inspired me 
to do better. Seeing that big smile on his face, it just filled my heart up. 2021, I was in an electrical accident. The times from me leaving the hospital until I met Billy, I, I really wasn't sure on how I was going to live or how I was going to make it. He made me feel more at ease. And you know you can do anything you, you want, no matter what you go through in life. As long as you have the will, you have the way to do it. Some worthwhile lessons there. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live. is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.